Now, this is simply a fact of this time of year uh, in this part of the world. We have what we see referred to in the Word as the latter rain uh, coming together with the melting snows on the mountains of Lebanon. And you have a flood going on. <clears throat> in most of the places that, uh, you know, you would cross the Jordan at this time of year, you're talking in terms of hundreds of yards of raging torrents of water. So it's not a little deal. And uh, the interesting truth is that if they had been willing to wait for about three months, then it'd be back to a creek size and a miracle wouldn't have even been needed. But now is the time that God tells them to cross. And as we'll see, you know, probably later, there are military reasons that made it important. Joshua was one of the foremost military commanders in all history. I can remember, uh, you know, in college, sitting in military science classes, listening, to, listening about Joshua's battles. He was a tactical genius, uh, strategic uh, genius as well, I believe. And, you know, and his, his tactics and strategy are studied today in all branches of the military in any, uh, you know, military classroom setting you might go into. There were reasons militarily it needed to happen now. They couldn't wait three months until the flood subsided. And they wouldn't have needed a miracle. They wouldn't have gotten a miracle and the doubts are very great that they would have had a lot of success in becoming conquerors and the conquests they had to make in order to experience the, the blessing of God's abundance in their life. You know, one of the uh, misunderstandings a lot of people have is that God's just, he's, he's, he's just a loving, and he is these things, a loving beneficial, abundant, graceful God who will do it for you no matter what you do. And you can understand from your own experience in life, probably yesterday and the day before, that ain't true. You know, you see that it's not God's grace with no other constriction or restriction uh, that is going to bring you into your land it is a process of you're making your own decisions. God loves you. He is El Shaddai, but he doesn't pour more than enough on you just because you enter covenant with him. He says, I've placed before you this day life and blessing, death and cursing, but you choose. We have to make choices that are going to direct our experience of life. You don't like what your life is right now? And don't be saying, God, why did you not do this? Or God, I prayed and you didn't answer. Or God, I've been in faith and it didn't come. No, you don't like where your life is right now. You need to begin looking at the choices you've made. I'm getting off course, but it's a simple truth. Your side of the covenant is to align your life with who God says he is. And he tells you that in his word. And as you align your life with his word, you're aligning your life with his abundance. El Shaddai. At any rate, so uh, I guess I better get back to reading the scripture here. But we can understand that uh, this time of year, you know, the Jordan was hundreds of yards wide, raging torrents. They couldn't wait three months until it had receded. Militarily and in terms of God's timetable, it just was not doable. They had to go now. But in order to go now, they had to have a miracle. And we see in verse 16 that as soon as the feet of the priest had been dipped in the water, verse 16, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam. And that is beside Zaratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. 
And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Chapter 4, verse 1, And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe, a man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and you shall carry them over with you, leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in the time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then you shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Well, this place where they lodged is not called out by name right here, but in the next chapter or two, it's referred to as Gilgal. And they made a memorial of stones at Gilgal so that all subsequent generations, you know, would know that this is where God performed a great miracle. So that's what we're looking at, a great miracle. It is on a par with the Red Sea miracle, but has a different purpose. And there are different earmarks uh, that, that need to be noted. I mean, I, I mean, if it's Actually, the subtitle of this sermon is The Miraculous. Because if it's true that God's going to initiate your life of conquest, victory, and blessing with a miracle, which it says right here is the case. When it's time for you to cross your Jordan, when it's time for you to take that first step, into the impossibilities that lie between you and where you're convinced God wants you to go, there will be a miracle. And if that's the case, then we know, need to know a little bit more about miracles, I think. Well, first of all, there, there are ditches on either side of the miracle road. There's one ditch that a lot of the body of Christ is in, who have become so intellectually arrogant that they feel like, and it's very often professed, that God's not doing miracles anymore. Maybe that was for the startup of the New Testament church or other things that, you know, the Bible writes about. But he, he you know, he doesn't do miracles today. That's one ditch because he is a miracle-working God. The other ditch is that you're just trying to live from miracle to miracle because you don't see how you can get through your challenges in your body without a miracle, in your marriage without a miracle, without divine intervention. How am I ever going to get the kind of money that uh, would fall in the category of being more than enough? Uh, you know, it's miracle living. Living for a miracle is a better way to put it, not miracle living. But the other ditch is living for the miraculous. And I think that is rooted in part on a misconception of God's sovereignty. A lot of people just say, well, God, he created all of this. He is sovereign. If this thing happens to me, he either let it or did it. So God's sovereignty is what is going to determine the outcome of my life. And, you know, I know what I need right now. I need him sovereignly to intervene in my challenge and bring a miracle, or I'm stuck here. That's the other ditch. So where does the balance lie? I mean, on one side, 
God doesn't do miracles anymore. On the other side, you don't know how you're going to survive without a miracle. And he's God, and he can do one if he wants. And so I'm going to pray for a miracle. I don't have the goods to deal with this issue. So it's got to be a miracle or utter failure, maybe death. Or God doesn't deal any miracles anymore. Balance is that God does mostly do miracles for unbelievers. Confirming the preaching of the word with signs following, the miraculous often occurs in a, an unbeliever's life to convince them to look further into the word or in the life of a very young believer such as we saw in the wilderness when they're still trying to decide if they really want to do this God thing or not. You know, they got born again, but everyone's subject to second thoughts. And so, you know, you see miracles done for the unbeliever and really young believers. Uh, but, you know, you also see miracles done in specific instances for believers. And those instances always have to do with bringing you into a life of conquest, into a life of victory, into a life of blessing. And again, I feel this thing coming at me. I don't want to conquer anybody. I just want to, you know, I want to relax a little bit, get out from under the gun, whatever's stressing you out. Come on, think bigger than that. There has to be a purpose somewhere that will stir an ember of fire that was once born in you and cause it to ignite again. Because without purpose, I'm telling you, uh, you know, that's like throwing in the towel on life. And I don't care how old you may be. And it isn't just related to, uh, to the older folks. There are a lot of young people that don't want to do anything except get on their devices and to heck with the world play video games all day. And I'm not mocking or making fun of anybody or, you know, the wonderful technology that is available that can be used the right way. But the point being, you've got to have a purpose in you that is born of God. He doesn't make it hard to find out what it is. I don't really want to spend the time going here again because I do this a lot. But you have to listen to the desires that aren't infected by your flesh. The desires that don't originate from your flesh. That are in line with the word of God. And there will be those kinds of desires for everybody. Somebody just might like to tinker with mechanics a little bit. Somebody might like to rebuild engines. Somebody might, you know, might uh, be naturally artistic and can draw and they, they, they have a desire to do that. I don't know what it is. I mean, there are many that have a desire just to invest themselves in their children and raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Desire will tell you where your land of promise lies. That'll give you the orientation toward it. And once you acknowledge that fact, and start praying in the Holy Spirit about God's will for your life, things will start coming that will take you down the path of that desire that is born in you by the Holy Ghost. And God said in Psalm 37, 4, that he has given you the desires and secret petitions of your heart. That's the Amplified. All we have to do is commit our way unto him. That means use the Word of God to shape your view of how to live this life and be committed to it. Yeah, you'll make mistakes, but get back on the path. Be committed to it. Trust Him. Commit your way unto the Lord. Trust Him. And what will He do? Bring it to pass. Don't have time to elaborate or I won't finish this message. But understand you can't allow a purposeless life 
to continue because it's taking you toward death. Death is seldom instantaneous. It's a progression. It's to slide down a hill that is filled with darkness and difficulty until life is literally gone. So, if you feel without purpose and you're having trouble getting stirred at the idea of having a mark that you've got to press toward instead of being able to lollygag around on your little device or, you know, prop your feet up in front of the TV, all of these things, you know, perhaps can be a blessing, but not if they rob you of your purpose. All right, enough about that. So basically, we need to understand there are ditches, miracle ditches. He doesn't do them anymore. Or oh, that's the only thing that's going to save you is if you can talk God into a divine intervention, give you a miracle to get over this problem. But then there'll just be another and another and another and another. He wants you to learn how to live by faith, not by miracles. And the middle of the road is to understand most of the miraculous things you'll see in your Christian walk will be done for believers' benefit, unbelievers' benefits or new believers. You are entitled to expect miracles of a certain type in your life, and those are the ones that propel you into a destiny of conquest and blessing. So, um, that's one important point to know. The second significant thing, I believe, is for you to realize uh, the difference between the Red Sea miracle and the Jordan miracle. The Red Sea miracle was to take believers, unbelievers, or young believers out of captivity to the world that they were in. And it's the kind of miracle that had no natural explanation for it. Moses sticks his rod out over the Red Sea. It splits. The water piles up a couple hundred feet high on either side. They walk across on dry ground. And as soon as the last uh, uh, of them have crossed, the water closes in on those that were pursuing them. An absolute demonstration of the miraculous power of God without any natural explanation. You know, every now and then somebody tries to explain the Red Sea away, uh, you know, by saying, for instance, well, they didn't really cross right at the Red Sea. It was a place called the Sea of Reeds uh, where they, you know, the water was only ankle deep. They could just walk across. Well, it's even more of a miracle that the whole Egyptian army drowned in ankle deep water. I mean, but we, we know for a fact that uh, the Red Sea, of course, is <clears throat> unexplainable in natural terms. And that's going to typify the kind of miracle that is done for the benefit of the unbeliever or really new believer. The uh, other type of miracle, as you live under your covenant with God, as I've said, is going to be to propel you into a life of conquest. And it's the kind of miracle we see at the Jordan. It's not somebody else holding out a rod and this thing happens. It is you taking a step of faith into the water of impossibility and watching it divide. With each step you take, the water divides a little more and then a little more and then a little more. These steps of faith are what are required. I mean, the Lord didn't make any bones about it. You know, you're going to walk across the Jordan. Well, you obey him because you believe his word is the way you need to live. <clears throat> You're convinced of that. And so you begin to step into the waters of impossibility, which begin to part as you make your way. Jordan does have a natural explanation. And uh, you can read this in a lot of theology books, actually, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, at this time of the year, uh, the Jordan flooded. It was no longer a little creek. You could wade across hundreds of yards across of raging torrents because the water piles up. 
at this little city called Adam, well out of sight of where they crossed. Uh, that's where the erosion occurs, the landslides occur. Uh, that's where the river often gets blocked off until it can cut new channels, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, there's the, that natural explanation for this. Uh, but it's no less of a stupendous miracle because it's a miracle of timing. And oftentimes we miss those miracles because we can find a natural explanation for something. In substance, we can explain away naturally what happened. We say it in a miracle. Like, you know, uh, somebody, it's a life and death situation that somebody get to Chicago within a, just a matter of hours. They can't possibly make it over the road. They have no money for an airline ticket, but somebody buys them an airline ticket and they go. And they don't call that a miracle. You know, unless God levitated them from Minneapolis to Chicago, <laughs> it wouldn't be a miracle. Yet, timing issues become significant in our determination of miracles we need and miracles that we get. And basically, you know, our faith can be involved to the extent, you know, we can't mandate that a particular brand of miracle happened, but we can take our steps of faith and rest assuredly in the fact that it will occur. Again, verse 10. Have I talked to you enough about the parasites and the Hittites and, <laughs> and all of that? But, you know, once again, the opposition that they receive, you know, he's saying, I'm doing this. Verse 10 says, Joshua said, hereby you shall know that the living God is among you. That's why he's doing this miracle of propelling you into your life of conquest, victory, and blessing. Because then you'll have something you can look back to and know that the next bunch of parasites you face or the next bunch of Amorites you face or the next obstacle, the next conflict, because conflict is going to be a fact of life when you begin moving into your land of promise. There will be opposition of a sort that, you know, a lot of people just don't want to engage in. I'll stay this side of the Jordan. I'm okay where I am. Well, you said that you have enough. God can't do any more than that but he can always do what you're willing to allow him to do. And you allow him to do it by seeing where you're to go, by having that conviction of your heart that this is your destiny in God. And you know there's an impossible obstacle. Maybe it's a Jordan, maybe it's a Jericho, a walled city, giants, I don't know what it might be. It's an obstacle. Well, you take a step of faith, in the timing that God quickens to your heart, do it in faith, and you'll see the impossibility begin to divide in front of you. That's why he does this. So you can know as you become, you know, uh, determined to pursue his highest and best for your life, you can know he's with you because when you take that step of faith, He'll do a miracle. And of course, you know, uh, I think perhaps one of the most significant considerations is that we build a memorial. We build our own little Gilgal. When we experience these miracles, and you will, then you have to make a memorial there that will affect all subsequent generations. Because it says to them, this is what happened in my parents' lives and the lives of my leaders and our ministry. This is what happened. And so we can know that God is with us. Just as surely as he said, Joshua, I'm going to be with you as I was with Moses. He's saying the same thing to us and then confirms it with the miraculous. So I guess our, our takeaway, if I'm going to have to close this, and I am, uh, uh, at the moment, I'm probably not done talking about the miraculous, not finished yet. Uh, if that's the case, I'll do it next week. 
But basically, uh, first of all, we take away from this text that we have to take the step of faith before the waters will part. People that are in covenant with God, you know, that's the typical one occasion you're going to get a miracle. I mean, there'll be other examples of possibilities, but this is the principal one. And so you want to realize not to overlook the miracles of timing uh, that are just as important as miracles of substance. It really doesn't matter. It's going to open the door for you to begin your, your life of conquest, conquering the obstacles that stand in front of you. And so uh, that step of faith is always going to be needed. And, uh, you know, again, another possible rabbit trail would be to talk about you can take a step of foolishness and presumption as opposed to faith. So it's important that you know what a step of faith is and, and be able to distinguish uh, between that and the kinds of things that you hear people say that don't know anybody. I'm just going to believe. I'm going to do this anyway. I know, you know, Sky might fall, whatever. I'm going to do it anyway. No, a step of faith has been calculated in light of what God says uh, you should be believing about this. He says some of that in his word, and he says it to you by the Holy Spirit. And the key is what we see here, so that you know that you know. You're not hoping. You're not, you know, putting up a good front for your faith friends. Uh, you know that God is going to perform. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to stay connected with our ministry, sign up to receive our Winner's Way weekly email. Every Friday, you'll receive encouragement, information on our next broadcast, and details about upcoming events. You can visit our website to sign up. Next week, we're starting a new series entitled The Way of Escape. I encourage you to tune in. Have an awesome week, and as always, remember, God wants you to be a winner in every area of life.